Fun Factor is perfect. Control starts off feeling like a generic third-person shooter, almost disappointingly so. The service weapon feels sort of cookie-cutter, it's not that interesting by itself, but then Control introduces telekinesis, and now you can throw things at people, and then Control introduces quick evasion, and the speed of combat increases significantly. And as you make your way through the game and unlock new abilities and upgrade your service weapon with entirely new forms that turn it into a shotgun, a sniper rifle, and more, Control slowly builds into into one of the most entertaining third-person shooter experiences of the year. By the time Control ends, you've basically built yourself into the Scarlet Witch, except you're also armed with a shape-shifting gun from another dimension, and nothing can stop you, you're the director. Mechanical depth and longevity is average. Control is an 8-12 to hour game without any real replay value, which isn't quite enough when I'm blowing the budget for two weeks of food on a video game. However, I'm rating this higher than I should because I think Control would be a really interesting game to speedrun. Levitation, quick evasion, and telekinesis make it really easy to get in places where you shouldn't be, and because of that it's gonna be a treat to see what people do to Control over at GDQ. Level design is poor. Control is structured like a Metroidvania, but it's a really mediocre take on that kind of design, and it feels like they should have done something else. My idea of a Metroidvania is that you open up new shortcuts and new areas for yourself as you get new abilities and progress through the game. Control just feels like a pale imitation of those concepts. You can open up shortcuts for yourself, but they're all very superficial and unimportant because you'll never use them. That's because the game has its own fast travel system, which you can use to travel between other fast travel points and other sectors, which completely nullifies the entire point of shortcuts in a Metroidvania. Maybe if there were less fast travel points in this game, there'd be more of a reason to use the shortcuts, but the game is comparatively littered with them, and they're much closer to mission areas than I'd like. There's not a reason to care about the shortcuts. Feature necessity and balance is a mixed bag, average overall. I think Control does a good job of getting you to use your powers in combination with the service weapon. Ammo and energy both recharge when they're not being used, and one is usually filled by the time you've expended the other, which creates this really awesome flow where you're constantly adjusting your strategy between straight firefights and scarlet witching your way through the arena. On the other side of the ocean is feature necessity. One of my least favorite modern video game trends is this thing where designers throw in unnecessary necessary RPG elements just to extend the lifespan of their video game, and I hate it. Control does this exact thing. They throw in these random weapon mod drops that add varying stat boosts like 30% more headshot damage, or 15% less ammo consumption, or if you've picked up a personal mod, maybe you consume less energy on a dodge, or you get more health from health pickups. Even worse are the apparently random timed events, which seem to serve practically no purpose since you can find their drops through normal gameplay anyways, and they do a good job of interrupting cutscenes with loud, blaring notifications that say that you've run out of time to shoot hiss clusters in the research sector. I really think the effort would have been better spent on creating interesting gameplay situations that require the use of your powers, which is something that Remedy is more than capable of creating considering their past work on Max Payne and Alan Wake, and not this quasi-RPG shit that Control doesn't need. Consistency and controls are above average. Control controls pretty decently, holds space to levitate in the air, mouse 5 for a shield, F to switch weapon form, V to melee, and all the movement feels platform or precise. I'm particularly impressed with how they've handled telekinesis. You don't actually need to aim at any object in particular to use it, you just need to hold the button and Jessie will automatically pick up whatever's closest to her, which is something that just feels really intuitive. That being said, Control's controls have some holes. The aforementioned telekinesis will sometimes pick up a random object when you're trying to deliberately pick up one object in particular. Not fun when you're trying to pick up a potted plant and you pick up a forklift instead. The service weapon in grip form also feels pretty inconsistent, in no small part due to Control's tacked on RPG style stats. Precise shots are a real issue since your accuracy is affected by weapon mods, so you start off with imperfect first shot accuracy and you can never really get perfect first shot accuracy at all. Thankfully, Control isn't really a difficult game, so this isn't a severe issue. Voice acting and dialogue is excellent. 
The cast of Control is basically a collection of Remedy's greatest hits. James McCaffrey, Matthew Peretta, Courtney Hope, and Sean Dury all play major roles in Control. Matthew Peretta brings out the thoughtless intellectualism of Dr. Casper Darling, the mad scientist. James McCaffrey uses his signature voice to make Zachariah Trench seem more authoritarian than he already is. Sean Dury's character is as terrifying as a Joker, and Courtney Hope is as antisocial and mysterious as a psychic should be. There's also someone named Marty Suosalo who plays the character of Ati, the mysterious, apparently Finnish janitor of the oldest house. Ati is probably the most memorable character of the whole game because of his line delivery. His Finnish accent is reassuring, but there's something behind his words that just feels a little ominous. The dialogue and control is really awesome. Sam Lake was one of the writers for this game, and the same metaphor-heavy style that he used for Max Payne is also really evident in Control. And in many ways, it works even better in Control than it did in Max Payne because of how muddy the waters of the oldest house actually are. It feels like just about everything has a double or even a triple meaning. Board, oldest house, janitor, director, containment. Unpredictability is great. Control is mysterious by default because of its source material, so it's not at all difficult to make a really unpredictable story within its setting. Facts are constantly twisted, and it always feels like your allies have a hidden agenda, which is something that Jessie even points out herself. Her own brother is treated like a monster, and yet the Bureau accepted her without question. Polaris guides her throughout the house, but Dylan tells Jessie that Polaris is using her. Coherence and world building is a mixed bag, above average overall. Unfortunately, while Control raises dozens of questions about its unique setting, it never cares to actually answer the majority of them. Nobody ever elaborates on why Polaris can't be trusted. Nobody elaborates on what the Hiss actually are. Nobody knows why Trench seemingly lived in fear of his predecessor. Nobody explains what's living inside the power plant. And we never get any idea what Ati is outside of the implication that he's some sort of servant to the Elder Gods. On one hand, this really sort of sucks, because it feels like the game is building up for some absolutely world-shattering twist but Control sort of just puts a cap on it towards the end and it all just fizzles out. They could answer all of these questions in a sequel, but I have my doubts that we'll ever get one, since Control really hasn't been marketed at all since E3 2018, and it's released just a couple of weeks before Gears of War and Borderlands, and because of that, it seems like Control is doomed to a similar fate as Titanfall 2. On the other hand, I absolutely love Control's world building. The Oldest House is one of the most unique game settings I've ever seen, Scene, a physically impossible monolith stuck in the middle of New York City that nobody can see unless they're actively looking for it. The lore is unique in that a lot of it has redacted pieces that suggest normal words take on abnormal qualities within the house, leaving a lot open to player interpretation. Posters on the wall talk about building shifts that throw entire offices into brand new, previously unexplored dimensions. Workplace accidents happen where people get lost inside an endless maze or have their speech reversed. Common Tasks involve appeasing household items through seemingly religious rituals and cleaning out mold that takes the form of a parasitic white mass. Out of context, this all sounds really incomprehensible, but Control effectively makes this normal by making it clear that nothing is normal. Characterization is above average. Zachariah Trench is sort of interesting as a character. It's pretty clear from Jesse's experiences that directors don't get a choice in whether or not they accept their job, and Trench was one of those people. He was forced into the job seemingly at the expense of his wife and child, and his paranoia grew until he ended up letting the hiss into the oldest house. His mantra was to rely on no one but himself. Jessie herself is kind of interesting as well. She essentially had to grow up on her own since her parents disappeared during the ordinary AWE, and outside of that and a few therapy sessions, her backstory is completely unknown. The board is representative of something too. They often use juxtaposed word choices in their broadcasts, like lies slash fake news or direct slash weapon. Sometimes it's fitting, sometimes their statements are complete opposites of each other. The overall implication is that they're using the Bureau for their own agenda, although that agenda may never be seen by any human. Thematic strength is great. Control is one of the very few games that takes inspiration from SCP, that fictional universe filled with eldritch horrors created by the internet. I don't think Control adapts that sense of dread perfectly, but the themes of authoritarianism and morality still ring true. The Bureau has a callous disregard for human life, preferring progress and experimentation to the safety of the human race. 
Art style is perfect. There is almost no place in which Control doesn't look absolutely stunning. There's something really beautiful about passionless, featureless slabs of concrete making up an entire video game world. The oldest house is symmetry versus asymmetry, the monotone against the colorful, the biological against the synthetic. Control makes heavy use of an art style called brutalism. Whereas games like Wolfenstein have been described as brutalist, Control takes it to a whole new level. The gun is made up of squares. The stairs are squares. Squares, the televisions are squares, the level layouts are squares. Some of this game's most beautiful landscapes are entirely made out of squares, and the house itself is a square. Control also merges a weird retro aesthetic into its levels, with the in-game explanation being that modern technology tends to malfunction inside the oldest house. This creates some really distinct contrast between the modern minimalist architecture and the colorful but also boxy features of pre-2000s technology. Control has some really, really solid competition coming up in the next three months, but I'm certain that this game has the best art direction out of anything else from this entire year. It's just that distinctive. Animation is excellent. Remedy did a great job animating Jesse's character model. There's different animations for flying, jumping, falling, and dodging, with other little variations and details based on what speed Jesse is traveling at. It's almost on par with Uncharted 4, but I feel like facial animations are a little stiff, and also the animations can get really weird when you vault over things so it won't earn a perfect score. Sound is perfect. The sounds for your powers are really amazing, especially the sounds for telekinesis and dodging. Telekinesis has this really off-key whooshing sound, whereas dodges almost sound like a bullet ricochet. Honestly, everything in this game just sounds really nice, with the possible exception of the service weapon and grip form. They're clear and simple, and everything is mixed really well. Bug severity is above average. Control is actually a very easy game to break, especially later in the game when you get the levitation power. If you use it properly, then you can make it all the way to the invisible walls that mark the edges of the map, as well as places that Control deliberately tries to lock away from you. There's also entire parts of the game that completely break if you do the wrong thing. For example, I died during the game's second mini-boss. The game respawned me outside the boss area, so I chose not to actually fight him and just move on, but when I went back later, the Hiss Barricade spawned in behind me and trapped me inside, but didn't actually spawn the mini-boss that's supposed to remove those barricades. Soundtrack is average. I wasn't that impressed with the soundtrack overall, it just sounds like the standard techie grunginess that I've been hearing in action games for years now. That's not to say I absolutely hate it, but it's not that interesting overall. Microtransaction fairness is inapplicable. Control doesn't have any microtransactions and no real micro DLC as far as I can tell. Atmosphere is average. I'm actually really surprised at how non-atmospheric Control is considering its huge focus on SCP subculture and overall surrealism. The game just doesn't feel very atmospheric, and I think that has to do with both ambient noise as well as Control's own fast-paced nature. Player agency is above average. Control already has a leg up when it comes to overall player agency since it's a game with a semi-open world. There's always one main path you're supposed to go down, but Control does a decent job of getting players to explore and go on side quests, as those offer extra abilities and weapon mods that give Jesse Faden an advantage over the Hiss, not to mention all the extra pages of lore scattered around the oldest house. Innovation is above average. Control doesn't really do anything exciting in terms of gameplay or narrative, but I think the fact that it's basically a love letter to SCP is more than enough to make it stand out amongst the competition, notwithstanding its ultra-distinctive art style. Pacing is a mixed bag, above average overall. I usually give games lower pacing ratings when I feel like they move too slowly, but Control actually has the opposite problem. The game just ends way too quickly. The entire third act feels very rushed. As I said in the narrative section, the game leaves way too many unanswered questions, questions which could have been answered if Control maybe had an extra five hours to tie up the loose ends in such a way that it doesn't need a sequel. I have some suspicions that this game was rushed out the door, so since the last part of the narrative is entirely delivered through an FMV cutscene, as opposed to a full mission like practically every other part of the story, and the fact that the last mission involves fighting mobs of enemies rather than a full boss. However, the preceding two acts are actually paced really neatly. Control knows exactly when to introduce new powers to the player, they give you lots of time to play the game without all of your powers, so you get some sense of actual progression, and they also build those levels around your powers so it functions like an invisible tutorial. You get a 
section with physics-based puzzles with your telekinetic powers, you get platforming with your evasion powers, and you have a multi-floored prison to explore with your levitation powers. The third act starts after you get your levitation powers, however, and that's where the game begins to fall apart. Overall, Control earns a 16.5 in gameplay, a 19.5 in narrative, a 20.0 in polish, and a 17.0 in the miscellaneous category. This gives Control a score of 73 out of 100, placing it in mid-high tier, tying it with Dirt Rally 2, and placing it in between Metro Exodus and Minerva Metastasis. Control's closest rival to the south is Metro Exodus, which has a score of 72 out of 100. As you might expect, the two games match each other pretty closely. Metro Exodus holds single-point leads in the gameplay and miscellaneous categories, but Control has a single-point lead in the narrative section and a two-point lead in the polish category. Control's closest rival to the north is Red Dead Redemption 2, which has a retrospective score of 83 out of 100. The two games roughly match each other in the polish category, although Red Dead Redemption 2 has a slight half-point lead. However, Red Dead Redemption 2 holds a 1.5-point lead in the gameplay category, a 2-point lead in the miscellaneous category, and a 5.5-point lead in the narrative category. Control is one of the most memorable games I've played from 2019 thus far. Its amazing art style, fun combat, and weird setting make for one of Remedy's best games ever, even against the legend that is Max Payne. Still, this game could have been even better than Max Payne was, but unfortunately the game just ends before any of the biggest questions can get answered, and that's truly its biggest drawback. It's still an easy recommendation so long as you have the spare cash, and it's already one of my favorite games of the year. I would absolutely love to have a sequel, but unfortunately I fear that Control will inevitably get overlooked for the behemoths of Gears 5, Borderlands 3, Modern Warfare, and Death Stranding. Especially Death Stranding, since that game also has a ton of creepy surrealist imagery, just like Control. While Control is a great game on its own, these other games have much larger followings and appeal to a lot more people. Control simply can't compete with that, and so it's possible that the mysteries of the oldest house will never be unraveled.